Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, I meant to change that title to Doing Church with the Martyrs, but <laughs> there will be a lot of historical information in our talk tonight, and um, it comes from many different sources, primarily from Frox's Book of Martyrs, a couple of church histories, and some other sources, and without at each point trying to acknowledge those sources, let me just give a blanket, we're okay, kind of thing. The second thing about some of this information is that it's very old and from the antiquities, and therefore at times we are not sure about the accuracy. I've tried my best to glean away and peel away the Catholic mythologies that get laid over the top of of these kinds of histories, and um, so that uh, the information is as accurate as we can as we can have. We have been thinking over the last few weeks about how the early church leaders fought to uphold the truth. They stood in a long line of godly men and women who left us a strong and vibrant biblical legacy. And I asked Pastor Dale if I could close this series by bringing us back to these leaders in the early church who not only fought for truth, but gave their lives for Christ. And many of them gave their lives for Christ and what we would think of as the mission field. The book of Hebrews was written in a time during the first or second persecutions of the church. And it was washing over the church and causing great trouble. And in that context, the author writes to us about our own church leaders, and particularly about past ones who we will think about tonight and present ones who I serve among. And so first, in Hebrews 13, verses 7 and 8, our author says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, first, I want you to notice the quality of godly leaders in verses 7 and 8. The hurt church to whom this was written had had exemplary leadership in the past. For whatever reason, these men were no longer with them. It's possible they were martyred. We do not know for sure. They were marked out as the teaching elders who had spoken God's word to the congregation and had lived godly lives whose faith sustained them through to the end. That sort of faith is to be carefully evaluated and esteemed and emulated. Elders are commended when they live out their teaching in lives whose faith causes them to be faithful. Yes, even if called upon unto death. Do we as leaders live and conduct ourselves in such a way that people see faith through us so clearly that they can imitate the truth that is being believed? Even though leaders come and go within God's providence, Jesus never changes. In this, it almost sounds abrupt, doesn't it? Remember your leaders, these godly ones who led you and spoke to you the word of God, and Jesus Christ never changes. Why does he say that? Why do those two sentences go together? Well, quite simply, it's just that godly leaders will come and go for many different reasons. And in their day, godly leaders were under enormous pressure to recant faith or to go to prison, or to give their lives. 
And though we can find much to admire and imitate in the lives of godly men and women, we must build our lives on the foundation of an unchanging Lord Jesus Christ. Leadership must learn and grow and cultivate grace and experience sin overcoming victory. But that is to say, human leadership changes. We grow, we learn, we struggle with sin, we overcome, we learn. But Jesus never, ever changes. You will wake up every day the rest of your life and the rest of eternity and find him to be exactly as he is today. And so we are to remember, to recall, to look back to these godly leaders. And so in this, he establishes the quality. But then notice in verses 9 through 16, if you are to remember, but we are also to give our hearts, to give our lives to the teaching from godly leaders, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin, they're burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. Here, we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now, this paragraph of truth is that which the leaders that they were to remember had spoken to them. These were the truths they were to hold fast to and which they were honestly struggling with. And to wander away from. And so godly leaders seek to keep the church pure in doctrine and duty. What they have taught us keeps us from wandering into error. What they have taught us is to focus on the gospel and all that it means for our salvation and our transformation. What godly leadership teaches us focuses our gaze on the heavenly and on the eternal. It helps the temporal to loosen its hold on us and graces our grip on the eternal and the heavenly. Godly leaders then help us to focus on what is important. There are many distractions to draw us aside from pleasing God. But we are brought over and over again to the centrality of Christ, the worship of God, and the deeds of love to one another. And then our author reminds us of our responsibility then to our present godly leaders. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account now let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, let me remind you that our author is writing this not in the context of our ease and comforts that we have here in the West. He is writing it to a church that's under duress, a church that's lost leaders, church that's lost people. It's a church that has people who are in prison who need to be visited and identified with, a church whose people are losing their possessions. And so here are three commands that are given as a part of following spiritual leadership. The two are given in reference to their own elders and one in reference to the author himself. Now, some of what I have to say to you may appear, frankly, a little self-serving. I serve 
on and among and with the people being referred to here. But I want to carefully exposit what the scriptures are, scriptures are saying and then reflect on how these have been applied in the lives. And first, he says, to obey your leaders. It's kind of straightforward and simple. This word is usually translated by the words, be persuaded or be confident. We are responsible to be poised to be persuaded by our spiritual leaders. Our poise is to listen and learn. And as their words align with the scripture, then I am persuaded to obey my spiritual leaders. And then submit to their authority. The phrase here is one word in the Greek, and most translate it, make it submit, and then add to them for clarity. The word means to put myself under another. Therefore I, and I mean me, I put myself under the authority of our spiritual leaders. Now we know that sinning elders are dealt with, 1 Timothy 5. Elders are to be open to counsel and the opinions of those in the congregation. Elders are not to rule as dictators. And the congregation is not to stubbornly resist spiritual leaders. And what is to motivate us to obey and submit? Well, the elders are responsible to give an account to God for you. We are like soldiers on the night watch. We carefully stay alert because we will give a morning report to the commander. And secondly, uh, obeying and submission makes shepherding a joy and not a burden. There's no joy like seeing children progressing and growing up in humble submission. And there's no grief like a rebellious, stubborn son who resists and will not bend his will. This makes the ministry profitable to you. Sometimes the usefulness of ministry fails because of failure in the elder or elders. And sometimes the ministry is without profit because of the people. So your responsibility is to obey, to submit, and to pray for them. Verses 18 and 19. The author exhorts it in relation to himself. And those ministering or shepherding with him, because of that he can assure them that his own conscience and conduct are clean are pleasing to God following our spiritual leaders in submission submissive obedience is much easier when we are praying for them maybe we see needs maybe we see shortcomings that's that's not hard but when we do we're faced with the choice we can criticize or gossip or we can pray and talk to them and give God time to change them in other words we treat them as we would expect to be treated. Whether we pray for our spiritual leader may really be the gut test of remembering and following them. Now, in this context, then, of remembering those who have gone before, who have taught us the word of God, and have given us an example of faith, to be emulated, I want now to just take the rest of our time together to walk through, first, the apostles. Consider the example of the apostles. Note how many gave their lives in what we would think of as the foreign mission field. They were obedient to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so the apostles, those men standing in front of Jesus on that mountain on that day, they took the gospel into all the world. And many of them poured out their life's blood there. I'm listing these somewhat in the order, as we believe, in which they gave their lives. Philip. Philip was born at Bethsaida in Galilee and was first called by the name of disciple. He labored diligently in Upper Asia 
and suffered martyrdom at Heliopolis in modern Turkey. He was scourged, he was thrown in prison, and afterwards crucified around A.D. 54. Matthew. Matthew, whose occupation was that of tax collector before he was converted, was born at Nazareth. He wrote his gospel in Hebrew, was later afterwards translated into Greek by James the Less. The scene of his labors was Partha and Ethiopia, and so which later country he suffered martyrdom, being slain with a halberd in the city of Nadaba around A.D. 60. Matthew labored in northern Africa and was martyred there. Peter, among many other saints, Peter was condemned to death and crucified, as some do write at Rome. And Hegesippus wrote that Nero sought charges against Peter to put him to death. When the people perceived it, they entreated Peter to flee the city. Peter started to and then decided to remain. Jerome says that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward, which he requested because he was, he said, unworthy to be crucified after the same form and manner as his Lord. Paul. Paul the apostle, after his great travail in ministry and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, suffered also in the first persecution under Nero. Abidias says that before his execution, Nero sent two of his trusted soldiers to bring him word of his death. They came to Paul while he was instructing the people. They desired him to pray for them that they might believe, upon which he preached to them the gospel of Christ. This done, the soldiers came, led him out of the city to the place of execution where he, after his prayers were made, gave his neck to the sword. Thus died Paul the apostle. Bartholomew. Bartholomew preached in several countries and having worked with the gospel of Matthew and translated it into the language of India, He propagated it in that country. He was at length cruelly beaten and then crucified by the impenitent idolaters. Thomas. Thomas, called Didymus, preached the gospel in Parthia, Parthia, which is part of modern Iran, and in India, where he aroused the rage of the pagan priests. He was martyred by being thrust through with a spear. You hear it? They're all over the world, taking the gospel, pouring out their lives, standing firm in an emulatable faith. Luke. Luke was the evangelist, was the author of the gospel, which goes under his name. He traveled with Paul through various countries and is supposed to have been hanged on an olive tree by the idolatrous priests in Greece. Jude, Jude, the brother of James, who was commonly called Thaddeus, he was crucified at Odessa, reached to Russia, Crimea, A.D. 72. Barnabas, Barnabas was of Cyprus, Cyprus, sorry, but of Jewish descent. His death is supposed to have taken place about 73 though we do not know by what means. Simon, Simon named Zelotes, or Simon the Zealot, as he is often referred to in the scriptures, preached the gospel in Mauritania, Africa, and even in Britain. He was crucified in Northern Ireland, in Britain, in A.D. 74. James the Less. James was the half-brother of our Lord. He was set aside to the oversight of the churches of Jerusalem and was the author of the epistle ascribed to him in the scriptures. At the age of 94, he was beaten and stoned by the Jews and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. Matthias. Matthias, of whom less is known than most of the other disciples, was chosen by casting lots to fill the vacant place of of Judas. He was stoned at Jerusalem 
and then beheaded. Andrew. Andrew was the brother of Peter. He preached the gospel to many Asiatic nations. But on his arrival at Edessa, he was taken and was also crucified on a cross. The cross was set in the ground as an X, not a T. Hence the derivation of the term St. Andrew's cross. John. John, the beloved disciple, was brother to James the Great. The churches of Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Thyatira were founded by him. From Ephesus, he was ordered to be sent to Rome, where it is affirmed he was cast in a cauldron of boiling oil. He escaped by miracle and some doubtful reports, surviving without injury. Domitian afterwards banished him to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation. Nerva, the successor of the ruler Domitian, recalled him. He was the only apostle who escaped a violent death. Several martyrs, though, are referred to in the pages of the New Testament. New Testament writers tell us briefly of those who gave their lives in service to the Lord. We begin with Stephen. Stephen, one of the seven, suffered martyrdom early. His death was occasioned by the faithful manner in which he preached the gospel to the betrayers and murderers of Christ. To such a degree of anger were they excited, they drug him out of the city and stoned him to death. This was with the consent of Saul, later the apostle Paul. The time when he suffered is generally supposed to have been at the Passover, which succeeded to that of our Lord's crucifixion and to the era of his ascension in the following spring. After this great persecution was raised against all who professed their belief in Christ as the Messiah, we are immediately told by Luke there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem and that they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. About 2,000 Christians with Nicanor, one of the seven, suffered martyrdom during the persecution that arose after Stephen. James the Great, the next martyr we meet with, according to Luke in the history of the Apostles' Acts, which James, the son of Zebedee, the elder brother of John, the relative of our Lord, it was not until ten years after the death of Stephen that the second martyrdom took place. No sooner had Herod Agrippa been appointed governor of Judea then with a view to ingratiate himself with him, he raised a sharp persecution among the Christians and determined to make an effectual blow by striking at their leaders. The account is given to us by an imminent primitive writer, Clemens Alexandrianus, ought not to be overlooked. He records that as Jane was led to the place of martyrdom, his accuser was brought to repent of his conduct by the apostles' extraordinary courage and resolution. He is said to have fallen down at James' feet to request his pardon, professing himself a Christian and resolving that James should not receive the crown of martyrdom alone. Therefore, they were both beheaded at the same time. In this way, the first apostolic martyr cheerfully and resolutely received that cup which he told our Savior he was ready to drink. Timon and Parnaeus suffered martyrdom about the same time, the one at Philippi and the one and the other at Macedonia. These events took place 44 AD. Mark. Mark was born of Jewish parents of the tribe of Levi. He is supposed to have been converted to Christianity by Peter, though that is under question under whom he served as an emanesis or a secretary. Mark wrote the gospel that bears his name. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria, Egypt, at great solemnity of Serapis, their idol, ending his life under their merciless hands. Antipas. 
He was a convert from paganism and is spoken of as a faithful witness by Jesus who wrote to the church of Pergamos in Revelation 2.13. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and you do not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful murderer who was killed among you where Satan And then consider the Roman persecution. There were known to be ten waves of persecutions under the Roman emperors. Christians were tortured. Women and children, young and old, whole families died for their faith in horrible ways. Drowning, burning parts of the body, being torn in pieces, burnings at the stake, being beheaded, were commonplace. It is said for several weeks that the countryside was lit up by Christians who were torched. With all this being done, the church increased. No one could say anything against the brave faith illustrated by these martyrs facing death. God's grace was upon them, and even more so in their death. And some of the most vicious persecutions were under the watch of Emperor Trajan. Ignatius wrote before his exit, Now I began to be a disciple. I care for nothing of visible or invisible things, so that I may but win Christ. Let fire and the cross, let the companies of wild beasts, let the breaking of bones and the tearing of limbs, let the grinding of the whole body and all the malice of the devil come upon it. Me be it so, only may I win And as he heard the lions roaring, he said, I am the wheat of Christ. I am to be ground with the teeth of wild beasts, that I may be found to be bread that is pure. And then consider the early church fathers. Many of those who served in the first 250 years of the church also gave their lives for the sake of the gospel, for the defense of the faith, and in service to Christ. Consider Polycarp. When Polycarp was brought before the judge and commanded to reject and blaspheme Christ, he decisively answered, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me wrong. How then... Can I blaspheme my king who hath saved me? It is written of Polycarp, so it befell the blessed Polycarp, who having with those from Philadelphia suffered martyrdom in Smyrna, twelve in all, is especially remembered more than the others by all men, so that he is talked of even by the heathen in every place. For he showed himself not only a notable teacher, but also a distinguished martyr, whose martyrdom all desire to imitate, seeing that it was after the pattern of the gospel of Christ. Fixing their minds on the grace of Christ, the martyrs despised worldly tortures and purchased eternal life with but a single hour. To them, the fire of their coral tortures was cold. They kept before their eyes their escape unto the, from the eternal and unquenchable fire. Martyrdom of Polycarp. Polycarp. Polycarp joined six others who were scourged and beheaded, and he was burned at the stake by Antonius Pius in the marketplace before a crowd. Ignatius. Ignatius was a friend of Polycarp, became pastor at Antioch. He was fed to the lions at the Colosseum of Rome under Trajan in 117 A.D. Justin Martyr, imagine, you know, here's someone who gave his life and it's become part of his name. Justin Martyr, an apologist for the faith, confronted Marcion, who rejected the Old Testament and issued his own New Testament, which consisted part of the Gospel of Luke and ten of Paul's epistles only. Justin Martyr was so bold, he wrote a defense of Christianity addressed to the Emperor Augustus Caesar, and he wrote, You can kill us. You cannot hurt us. Justin also died a martyr, beheaded at Rome in 167 A.D. Origen. 
Now, Origen, who seemed to waver between right doctrine of God's nature and sometimes heresy in other areas, still defended the Christian faith against the pagans and in 250 AD was put in chains and terribly tortured and died of his wounds. Cyprian. In 250 AD... The cry among Romans was Cyprian to the lions, Cyprian to the beasts. In 257 AD, Cyprian was brought before the proconsul who exiled him to a little city on the Libyan Sea. On the death of the proconsul, Aspasius Paternurus had Cyprian returned to Carthage, but was soon after seized and carried before the new governor who condemned him to be headed. His sentence was executed on September 14th, 258 A.D. But consider the sad intra-church persecutions. It was most confusing and most challenging when the persecutions broke out from within the church's walls. It was later when the Arians had gained full control that the former deacon Athanasius came to the forefront to battle long and hard over their error, their doctrine of Christ being a creature only and not deity and man. Historian Philip Schaff comments on the Arian movement stating, Arianism was a religious political war against the spirit of Christian revelation by the spirit of the world which, after having persecuted the church 300 years from without, sought under Christian name to reduce her by degrading Christ to the category of the temporal and the created and Christianity to the level of natural religion, against which Athanasius bravely, bravely fought. It became the issue in the church, and for the next 50 years, Arianism became a major movement inside the church from Rome. There were many others who defended Christ as God and the doctrine of the triune nature, but did not have the privilege of giving their lives, but continued to live for truth. Athanasius, defending the deity and the triunity of God's nature, was almost killed within the church as the disputes over doctrine became overheated. And we could go on and on and on. What are we to make of this? First, we are left a great legacy of faithful people who gave their lives. They met death in their own cities and across the world. They met death in defense of truth. They met death in taking the gospel to the unreached. Most of the apostles were martyred, obeying the Great Commission. Their example of risk for the glory of God and the going of the gospel leaves us with a challenge to send support and even go ourselves. But we are not all called by God to give our lives for Christ. This talk should not discourage us, but rather motivate us to live in such a way that we would be ready, if so called. But it also challenges our fragile, self-centered, and comfort-driven Christianity. And while the church fathers are distant memories and martyrs are long in heaven, we have gracious and good and godly leaders given to us by God. I serve among them. I serve under them. I serve at their pleasure. We as your leaders covet your prayers and your wisdom as we seek to be pleasing to God, as we seek to preach to you the word of God, as we seek to live out the faith that we believe and confess, and so will bring glory to God and be useful to his kingdom. And if God so calls and so ordains, then we will die in a way that brings him the most glory and the most good for his people. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you. Thank you for the example of men, and though we've not listed any women down through the ages, and even all over the world today, as many of my friends in China have gone silent, we don't know where they are. And Father, we are reminded 
There is nothing greater than to live for you and to die in your grace and for your glory. And whether we die naturally or whether we die at the hand of a persecutor and are thus martyrs, we want to live in a way that we are prepared to die with glory. Grant that all this may be so in Jesus' name.